Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Praise God. Ladies and gentlemen, today we intend to have probably the fifth and final part for now of Secrets of Divine Providence. Praise the Lord. How many of you attended the fourth part? You loved it? Can you hear those words and stay poor? No. Praise the Lord. There is something I have in my head, which probably would have been a sixth part, but it's not for some of you now. So it will wait until the church grows to a certain level. But um, for those of you who were here last week, you realize that I failed to finish. I wanted to also incorporate this in the fourth part, but it failed. It was We had a lot to cover in a short time, so we resulted to making this a fifth part to consequently give it more time because I would have taken um, the responsibility and, and burden to finish, but that would mean that I was going to just touch something that was very critical. So we intended and said, let us finish it all by giving it a fifth part because the fifth part in its own self was a sermon. I didn't see it coming, but in the middle of uh, the preaching, I started to realize that there was just a lot to be covered and it could not be covered in the time frame that I was given already. I had spoken for more than an hour. So I, I thought probably I would uh, make a fifth part to it. Hallelujah. And the reason why we've taught Secrets of Divine Providence all through them parts from the beginning up to the fifth part now is because we believe that the same things that any man can do to be rich, they are principles laid down for you to successfully live financially. We believe in a place of financial freedom for every Christian. We don't believe in depending and begging. Hallelujah. And we believe that it's very possible for a Christian to live a financially independent life. Because there are a lot of things that come with being poor. Poverty does not have glory. Hallelujah. You ask anybody who has been really poor. Some of you, your definitions of poor relative, what you think is poor is not actually poor. There are people who have really been poor. There are women right now selling their bodies on the streets. They do not want to sell their bodies on the streets, but they are poor. There's a woman right now living in a house with a man she is not supposed to be living with, but because she is poor. There's somebody taking a, 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 a course they're not supposed to take, but because of poverty. There are people sleeping a certain way, living a certain way, dressing a certain way because of poverty. They don't want to be there, but situations push them there. Poverty is a spirit, and it's an evil spirit. The Bible says that I'm come that you might have life and life to the fullest joy and speakable, full of glory. You can't have a joy full and speakable, full of glory without being provided for. God has called us to be rich. There is that old nominal Christianity that taught Christians that you have to be poor for you to go to heaven, you know. But their definition of poverty is not our understanding of poverty. Poverty, if that is the man needs Christ, that's a place of poverty. But it's also poverty for a man to lack in Christ. It's despicable. And as long as the church stays poor, there are certain places and certain things we can never have authority and control over. People are controlling this world the way they are because they have certain influences and the end result, money. The Bible says money answers all things. You better have what answers if you want to be a solution in this generation. There are certain places where your prayers can't work, your fastings can't work. You're not going to wake up in the morning and, for example, you're a married man and your wife wants fees for the kid and you're -ra 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 -ra. Listen. <laughs> the kid must go to school. You understand? Women don't understand you when you're on that faith level. You get it? Because it's your responsibility. And it's also understandable. Hallelujah. There's some things that can't go away except by money. 
Uh, Secrets of Divine Providence, part five. We want to pick, uh, I want us to have a particular direction that we're going to take, slightly probably different from the last part that we had, but you're going to see a very good correlation there. We want to mix it together. Um, let me begin with something I call the rule of the thumb. Tell your neighbor the rule of the thumb. The rule of the thumb, for those of you who don't understand, it's just a saying. Rule of the thumb means the primary thing. The principle every Christian should live by. The principle every Christian should live thinking through. The mindset every Christian must maintain in the direction of money. Okay? That's what we call the rule of the thumb. The primary thing. The basic line. You can call it the punch line. Whichever you want to call it. I chose to call it the rule of the thumb. The thing by which all things are. Praise the Lord Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. I want you to read it in three versions. Amplified, King James, and the message. Let's read. One, two, three. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Read it again. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you are is having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Give me the Amplified Bible. Let's read it also in the Amplified. Because it's a rule of the time. One, two, three, let's go. And God is able to make all grace, that is every favor and earthly blessing, come to you in abundance so that you may always and under all circumstances and whatever the need be self-sufficient possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation that's the rule of the thumb for every christian pertaining finances god is able to give you all grace, every favor you need, every earthly blessing you need to come to you, not in just simple lines, but in abundance, so that you may always and under all circumstances and whatever the need be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. Message version. God can pour on the blessing in astonishing ways so that you're ready for anything and everything, more than just ready to do whatever needs to be done. That's the rule of the thumb of the Christian faith. But it's all grace. Hallelujah. Go back to the Amplified and the King James. He tells you it's all grace. He's able to make all grace. All grace. Nobody should seek a wealth legally. You should seek a wealth by grace. You should seek to function by grace and not by legal requirement. Am I clear on that? So the Bible says that all grace can abound to your due, that you always have all sufficiency in all things that you may abound to every good work. It means it's a place and position for every Christian. I must have everything that I need as an individual, and I must always have excess for every good work, not some works. You understand? Every good work. Every good work. Every good work. Hallelujah. Now, there's a lot in there. You know that some people, I'll give you an example. I used to know people who say, um, me, for example, when I'm tithing, um, I can get like poor people, and then I give them, and then I get Pastor Gundi, and then I give them, then I get my cousin who's also in ministry, and then I give them. That's how I split my tithe. God said every good work. You must have a discernment for what is good. Now, as you continue to also grow in God, you realize that, for example, I can't tithe to a guy who is preaching the law if I'm a grace minister. Because I know the Bible says that the letter killeth. So why am I tithing in what killeth? Of course, there are some people who are still ignorant, and that's okay for you to be ignorant. 
That boy, are you ignorant? They say, ask me, I get my tithe, I give the so and so, I give this pastor, I give this brother, and then I give this other man of God who is an evangelist. That's how I distribute. It's because some of those people have not yet understood the depth of truth. They're still ignorant about how the gospel must be funded. But as you continue to grow in God, you realize you can't put your seed in dry ground. I mean, if the men physical have that wisdom, they have to dig up, they have to put nutrients, fertilizer, every kind of thing, just to make sure that they give the ground enough air, enough health, enough strength for it to hold a plant. Why do you get your seeds and then throw them on cement? What are you doing? Okay, you're giving God on cement. And then you want to come back after a few months and then find these seeds grow. There are churches we used to give to over the years and these churches are no more. We wasted our money. Who understands what I'm saying? We wasted our money. I don't want to put in something that is going to die tomorrow. I want to put in something that I'm sure can exist up to next year. But some people don't have that wisdom and that's okay. God, the Bible says in the days of ignorance, he winked. He looked away. But now he calls us all men to what? To repent. Change your mindset. Stop giving everywhere. Stop giving everything. No, give to every good work. What you design as good. But again, like I told you, it's a relative place because some people have not yet known a certain depth of truth. They still don't have a certain line of judgment to know that this is going to leave, this is not going to leave, this is good ground, this is not good ground. It's like, for example, I do not believe in giving to ministers who don't give. I don't believe in it. Because we as ministers as well must maintain a place of being ground fertile for the people. You are not tithing, but you're putting pressure on men to tithe. You're not giving fast fruit, and you're putting pressure on men to give fast fruit. You frustrate your seed. You get where I'm coming from? That people who don't care, of course, that people who say, uh, you give to God, you don't mind what the man of God does with your money. Yes, to a certain degree. But there comes a point where you take responsibility of what he does with it. He must be a giver as well. Hallelujah. And consequently, his life also must reflect a certain kind of increase. It must in- reflect a certain kind of increase. Praise God. Hallelujah. So the Bible says sufficiency for every good work. What work? What do I design as good work? Hallelujah. What do I design as good work? Why would the saints send money to Paul and refuse to send to the church of Jerusalem? When they are Christians at Jerusalem, Jerusalem? Yes, there were Christians at Jerusalem. But during that time, Jerusalem had Judistic and Hellenistic tendencies that were contrary to the grace message which Paul was distributing to the Gentiles. The Gentile church would be silly to send aid to Jerusalem when they're learning from Paul. But it's a place again of maturity. Hallelujah. There are some people who think every preacher preaches the same thing. You know, that general consensus, you have people who say, God is the same. We all have the same God. It's, it's ignorance. We don't all serve the same God. There's a reason why a man is putting on something in the neck and I'm not putting it on. There's a reason why a certain man is facing a certain black box and I'm not facing it. We are different. I said we are different. <laughs> Hallelujah. The same person, no, it's the same God because they are ignorant. They want to create a unity that is not of purpose because it's not after understanding. But there comes a time where the same understanding in God separates the sheep from the wolves. It separates the grain from the chaff. That place that separates the precious from the vile. Hallelujah. But it's again a place of maturity. Some people have not yet matured. So God understands. But one day he will not understand. Because they will be revealed. Like for some of you now it's revealed. Hallelujah. Back to the point. When God is, when the Bible says there's a grace, that grace, unmerited, it's not worked for, okay, that can work in my life to give me everything that I need, all sufficiency, that I will not need any aid. The Amplified says that you'll need no aid, 
that you will need no support, that you will need no nothing. Possessing enough to require no aid and support, furnished in abundance for every good work in, and charitable donation. It means that God has to give me abundance to give. Not little to give, but abundance to give. Are you hearing me? But number two, he must maintain me always and under all circumstances to be sufficient in whatever I need. I must first be satisfied and comforted on every side. And then he will give me, or he must give me more for every good work. In other words, it's possible for you to have everything you need, and after having everything for you to need, God gives you too much to give. You get where I'm coming from? So you're sufficient. You don't lack anything. You don't beg anywhere. You don't depend on any man. And after that, God also empowers you to give to every good work. But because it's a place of grace, it's not a place of law, he's not requiring you to do it, he has already done it by Christ. The Bible says it can only be of faith that it will be of grace. It can only be of faith that it will be of grace. Never forget that. It can only be of faith that it will be of grace. Everything called grace in the scriptures has a testimony of faith to it. The Bible says in Romans 4.16, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Everybody. Says that it can be fulfilled in everybody's life. Says that some of you don't say, Ah, it didn't work in my life, but it worked in so-and-so's life. No. At a place where it must work in everybody's life, it can only be of faith that it might be of grace. So the Bible says that God is able to give me all grace abounding for me to have all sufficiency in all I need and have more abundance for every good work. And he's saying it's a grace distributed unto me. It begins from a faith angle. I must first believe that I possess it before I start walking in it. Who understands where I'm at now? So 2 Corinthians 9.8 is a faith principle and a faith thought than it is an experience. You will enter the experience after you have begun walking in it by faith. That's why I told people, for example, ever since my campus days, when I met that portion of scripture, I should have been in second year, I learned to give to every good work. It doesn't mean that then I had enough money, but I had the mind and faith that I have all sufficiency in everything, that I will have everything abounding to me for every good work. And therefore, when I was there, and then they say, oh, there's a church that wants to build. I would guess, even if it's 1,000, I give it. Because that's what I have. But every time I give, I tell myself, I have all sufficiency for everything that I need, that I have availability for me to abound in every good work. That's the place of faith. Are you hearing me? And then you continue increasing your amount. Today you give 1,000, tomorrow give 2,000. You can begin with very small things. The issue is that the day that came in it. So the Bible says, despise not the day of humble beginnings. The beginnings might be humble or big. The point is there was that day where you made the decision and said, because I have faith that I'm available for every good work, everything that comes up, I must contribute a coin. I must contribute a cent. I must contribute a check. I must contribute an amount of money. Okay? And then the Christian starts to grow therein. Never let her work be done without your hand in it. How? If you hear that they're saying, oh, we're doing a, a, a praise rally, every good work, get 1,000 shillings, take it to Pastor Sam and tell him, this is for my good work. If your faith is 5,000, give 5,000. If your faith is 10,000, give 10,000. If your faith is 100,000, give 100,000. According to your faith of how much you have and your definition of abundance. Because you see, our point is not in how much you give. Our point is in the heart that gave because it has the attachment of the price to what the man gave. To some people, a million shillings is just something they release out of their pocket any second. To other people, a million shillings is something that they earn in four months. To some people, there's someone in this room and they have only 10,000 to themselves. And that 10,000, are you hearing me, is what they have in all their lives. They use that transport. They don't know how they're going to live tomorrow. Perhaps somebody will give them another 10,000. If that person got a thousand shillings and put it in for the praise rally, for example, in that project, the Jehovah God counts that that man gave, and he gave big, because it's a tenth of his, and it's different from the tithe he's going to get off tonight. That means he's going to spend a thousand shillings for the tithe, and he's going to spend two thousand shillings for that work. He might even spend another two or three thousand shillings for another thing, and then they might go back home with three thousand shillings. 
That man has given more than a man who is a billion shillings richer and he has just given a million shillings. You get where I'm coming from? Because a million shillings is not a tithe of a billion. So you get that mind? God wants you to give. The Bible says it's expedient that a man give as the heart and mind has been made up. Your mind must be made up circumspect to what you have because God, the Bible says, is the judge of all hearts. He knows your heart. He knows what you have and what you don't have. Don't be afraid to give 500 shillings. No, be afraid not to give when you must give if you're in that rule of the thumb. So every good work that comes, put something in it. If you don't have money, put your energy to it. You just put something into it. But never let a work pass and you have not given. Never do it if you want to be rich. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Never do it. I've been in this gospel and I've seen men who are working, who have some money, and then they say, oh, we need to do this. And then a guy just hears that and then goes back in his car and goes home. And then a student comes and says, Papa, my pocket money is 40,000, but I feel the Lord is telling me to give 10,000 for this conference. And I'm like, oh my God. This one is touching their, see, their pocket money to get 10,000 off for God. And this superstar is earning a salary and he doesn't have that mind. But he also wants to increase. <laughs> Do you don't understand. Evidently, Are you hearing me? That's not the point. The point must be that you must have sufficiency. Claim it. Every time you're giving it a big work, tell yourself one thing. I have availability. I have ability. You see, I am... I lead for Nero, but I give in for Nero. I give in for Nero. I give in for Nero. After teaching you, I give. After teaching you the gospel, I what? I give. And I don't earn a salary in for Nero. Why am I doing that? Because I must put myself in a place where I have sufficient in all good things that I don't need any aid or support. It's a place of thought. It's a mind. When you start to maintain that mindset, you will never beg. Why? God will produce a certain thing for you to have. He will produce a certain way. Remember the Bible says in Amplified, the Amplified of the very portion of Scripture, the Bible says He will create in every favor and every earthly blessing. Some of you just need a favor to get a job. You get what I'm saying? You just need a small favor for you to get the job you need. Just somebody to speak to someone. Simple. Just seconds and it's there. But it says every kind of favor and every earthly blessing. Every kind of favor and every earthly blessing. Somebody asked me, how do you get favor? By giving. If you're a giver, you'll be favored. You look at people who don't have favor in their life and they're rejected. They're also selfish people. Why? Because the spirit of selfishness kills everything that has life. And therefore, every time it comes close to life, life dies. Look at the Dead Sea. People know that the Dead Sea receives from all sources, but it doesn't give out. But I tell you scientifically that every fish that enters the Dead Sea dies. Why? Because it's receiving and not giving. So when a person, if you have a person in your life and they're not a giver, they kill everything that has life. That's why some people say, I have a spirit of rejection. That's what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs. When you get money, nobody can reject you. So that's a my spirit of rejection. No, you're just poor. You get enough money. Nobody will reject you. Tell me one rich man who is under rejection. Not there. The Bible says the poor are rejected. So those things of rejection, nobody loves me. The truth is they're actually trying to tell you you're poor. You get money. Everybody will love you. Everybody will love you. Everybody will love you. you even if they say you're ugly the day you get money. My God. You look too cute, everyone will be saying, <laughs> but really you got what? Money, because it's an answer. Hallelujah. The poor is hated. Even his own. But the rich has many friends. Proverbs 14, 20. So when someone comes to you and they tell you, brother, I have a spirit of rejection, you know they are not givers. You just know they are not givers. They are poor. And therefore they are hated. Poverty can attract any kind of rejection until the day you start to release. 
That's when people start to favor you. Oh, I'm believing God for marriage. Learn to give. <laughs> you'll have many friends. Among whom you'll get a husband. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah. God can give you everything you need and make you available for every good work. And if you leave that principle, I promise you one thing. You're going to see increase in your life over there. As the Bible says, if we do not give up in doing good. If we do not give up in doing good. Why? I'll tell you something. This is to any man who has given for so long. I'm not talking about people who have just learned tithing last week or last year. If you've been a giver for so long, you're going to realize one thing. There's a point where you get to, and sometimes you say, who am I giving when I'm not seeing? You get it? But there's a point where one day you flip. There's just one day where your financial life will flip. It will be one day. Some of you don't see increase now. But the Bible says, but if you do not give up in doing good, in due season, you'll reap. Some people gave and then they gave up. You get it? And they say, ah, I overgave and overgave and overgave and then I saw nothing and then they gave up. No. But I said, let us not be wary in well-doing for in this season we shall reap if we faint not. Just don't faint. Keep on giving. I'm reaping things I've been doing since I was in campus. That's years ago. Many years ago. But we never gave up in the story. We never fainted. It might take two, three, ten, five years ago. That's okay. But the day it starts to come, brother. It will come quicker than the years you need. You see, when the Bible says that he can restore all the years that you lost through the canker and the eater up, he's serious. You can restore every year you lost. One day, money can come to you in so much an amount that it can make you do in one year what your brothers have been doing, the people you've been admiring, what they've been doing in ten years, in one year. Just don't give up. Some of you have a problem. You give, and then you realize people don't give back to you, and then you start complaining, oh, this guy, I'm the one who even gave him a car. He, really, he should have been treating me better. Can you believe I am the one who gave them food? Listen, you don't give men to give back to you. The Bible doesn't say you reap where you sow. The Bible says you reap what you sow. It's not who I gave it to, it's what I gave to God. Period. If she will not help you, God will create another way to help you. Either way, help shall come. Why? Because I'm not mandated to receive from who I give. I'm mandated to receive from the God who I give. So stop thinking, oh, me, that guy, I'll never even help him. No, no, no. Even if they don't give you tomorrow and then they turn their backs on you, stay blessing them. Why? Because your blessing is not based on where you sow. It's based on who you sow to, Jehovah God. There are certain people in this life, and you must settle it, who will never pay you back. Put it in your system. Accept it like you're fasting. And just know for today is somewhere in February. It's a kid that you have to fast. But sometimes you will limit God if you have to go to those people to think they're your answer. You know some of you, you gave many years ago and you failed to get returned and uh, you actually killed the seed you sowed by the words you spoke. The Bible says do all things without wailing. Do all things without wailing or complaining. Don't, don't go back to, cut on the one. No, no, no. Thank God you did. But somebody gives and then after a few days they say, I don't even know why I bought him. That's shut. I wish I'd used my shirt to... You see, by the time you do that, everything that you were speaking, every seed that you sowed has died there. Do all things without grumbling and fault finding and complaining against God and questioning and doubting among yourself. Give me the message version of that. Give me the message version of that. I want you to read in the message. Uh-huh. Do everything readily and cheerfully. No bickering. No second guessing allowed. Don't think. That you made a mistake to do something for somebody. No. There is no mistake in giving. God would have also re regretted why he sent Jesus and some people are not yet born again. 
for he so loved that he gave. Praise the Lord Jesus. Now, that said, I want to go back to the way we ended. Many people, you remember, I gave you the first church, which was Thessalonica. The second church was Corinth. And the third church was Philippians. And the fourth? Macedonia. Now, I want us to pick something from the Macedonia experience, because again, like I told you, um, we rendered Thessalonica zero, and then we rendered Corinth 30-fold, and then we rendered Philippe 60-fold, and then rendered Macedonian churches 100-fold. Okay, Second Corinthians chapter 8 from verse 1. It's something I need to be clear. I didn't finish that. Eh? You remember very well? But let me build from somewhere there. Let's read. Again. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Next verse. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto riches of their liberality. For to their power, uh-huh, and beyond their power, I bear them record and, yeah, beyond their power that they were willing themselves, uh-huh. Praying, Praying with us, uh-huh, with much entreaty that we would receive the gift, uh-huh, and take upon us the fellowship of ministering to the saints, verse 5. And this they did not, not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Let's go back to the first verse and to open your eyes to something. The first verse says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit the grace of God bestowed on the churches. Verse 1. The Bible says, We do you to wit the grace of God bestowed in the churches of Macedonia. Now, let me be a bit clear here. The Bible didn't say the church of Macedonia. Okay? So you should ask me the question, why am I calling it the fourth church if it's not the church but it's the churches? Huh? It was the church at Philippe. It was the church at Thessalonica to the church of Corinth but when it comes to Macedonia, he calls it the churches of Macedonia. You get the difference? And I'll explain why. If some of you know the map of Macedonia, you'll realize that Macedonia, in Macedonia is Thessalonica. In Macedonia is uh, uh, Philippe. In Macedonia are places like Berea. These were more fair than the Thessalonians because when they heard of the word of God, the Bible says that they went out to search out the matters to know that these words were. So you remember the Bereans? And uh, Corinth is just so down his end, it was cut off. Achaia, it was cut off later. But it should have had also a relationship. You actually realize that all Thessalonica, Philippe, Berea, were all churches in Macedonia. Are we clear to that part? Okay? But you realize that he's distinctive with the church at Thessalonica. He's distinctive with the church at Corinth. Corinth, like I said, is a part that was cut off later. But if you look at the map, you realize it's still connected. It's just down this end. Just somewhere down below the map in the south. But it's like a very small connection there. And then it goes out like this. And then the rest is water body. But we could also have counted it as part of the whole picture, Macedonia. Okay? But they're saying no because it was cut off. And they say Achaia was different, the city and the place of the Corinthian guys, from the other upper churches. So therefore we can say, okay, it's separate from the other three because they're in the upper picture of the map of Macedonia. Are we clear? Because again, even when he's boasting, you say, for I boast of the churches at Macedonia, to the Corinthian church, he's actually trying to tell them they're not part of their Macedonia, they're not part of you. It was later cut off, as they say. But there was a time they were all one, okay? So we're not going to minister from the part where they were all one. They're going to minister from the part where Corinth was different from these others. But either way, if now you understand that Macedonia is the bigger picture of Thessalonica and Philippe and the Berean guys, you'll all agree with one thing. Paul speaking to the churches in Corinthians, chapter 8, verse 1 about the, 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 the churches in Macedonia, plural, it meant that in the Macedonia region, there were particular churches that did something extraordinary. And that's why I want to call, I quote and, 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 and identify that also as a different kind of church. Because it was unique from the experiences of Philippians. Why? Because in Philippians, he tells you one thing. In Philippians, he says, 
that for you know, brethren, when I left Macedonia, no church communicated to me as concerning giving except you Philippians. For you kept on sending aid and aid and aid and aid as it was handled by a brother. I don't know whether it was Paphroditus or something. This was the Philippian people. But when he's talking about the Philippians giving very, very, very much, the Bible never talked of Philippians giving themselves. You see that? Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. Philippians chapter 4, verse 15. Are we there? Let's read. Now, you Philippians, the Bible says, Know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning the giving and receiving except you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I, I have all and abound all, and I'm full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an order of sweet smell, sacrifice, acceptable, well pleasing to God, and my God shall supply all your needs according to these riches and glory in Christ Jesus. They were givers. Philippe is givers. But there are some churches in Macedonia as of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. He says that I boast of churches of Macedonia. He has probably somewhere around Philippe. Probably somewhere around Berea. Probably somewhere between Berea and Philippe. They don't have a particular name, but they have a particular testimony. The Bible says in the second verse that they what? How that in a great trial, the Bible says, of affliction, they were afflicted. The Bible says the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power, that means in their ability and what they had, I bear record here and beyond their power, the Bible says they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty. Give me the amplified version of this verse. Very well, huh? Let's read. They were begging us uh -huh, most insistently for the favor and the fellowship of contributing in this ministration of the relief and support of the saints in Jerusalem. They were, you get what I'm trying to tell you? They used to plead with Paul to receive their gift. There are not people who you think Paul like we sing in churches today. Why eto torina yes wakueto totarina? Oh why eto torina yes wakueto totarina? Then the back up singer. Oh why eto torina those encouraging things. Siganga and si go. You know those songs. Sigani echiro. Then they come. But they need to be encouraged to give. They are encouraged to give. <laughs> Can we have a song while they are giving? Then they start to sing those songs to encourage you <laughs> to give. That's a different church. <laughs> they didn't need to be sung or because you see the singing melts one's affection to be, feel generous. <laughs> like people are humble on funerals. You know when people say, You know come here it's how I know it's all too fast. And that's when people say, by the way, I can actually die. <laughs> that guy is my birthday. I was with him. <laughs> then that sentiment makes them a bit more humble. That's why you see people are most religious on funerals. They say, where they walk, and got a band You don't see a guy coming like, sorry, man. Because <laughs> you can't go to the coffin like that. No. <laughs> you have to go humble. You might meet your Lord a few minutes. But when you think about it, some of these songs, it's just entirely religion. Incline my feelings to give. We don't give from feeling. We're not supposed to give from feeling, and I'll explain that shortly. Hallelujah. So yes, Thessalonica was one church. Corinth was one church. Philippe was one church. Paul wrote them, wrote about them and their level of giving, and God intended it. But when he got to the fourth part, he refused to give it a particular church. He called it churches. That means that there are special individuals who understand this. 
That's a place of a hundredfold. A hundredfold is not with a particular church. It's with particular individuals. It's with particular individuals. It's an individual thing. That's why I call it the fourth church. I call it the fourth church because I can collect all these individuals or particular churches in Macedonia and then give them one I like experience. For me, they're a particular church. They're 100% full church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, the Bible says they were begging most insistently for the favor and the fellowship of contributing the ministration, meaning they felt like they were doing them a favor to give. They were not doing the church a favor to give. Some of you think you're helping the church because you're Thessalonica. But if you are not Thessalonica, you'd realize you're not doing the manner favor. Why? Because the people you're giving are abounding. We're not poor men, okay? And we don't earn salary from this church. You get it? You understand what I'm saying? We are all doing this one thing to build the body which is of Christ. But you see, how these are just deeper than I give my tithe, I give my whatever, and then they get to a point where they are pleading with the apostles to receive. They are pleading with them to receive. And on top of just being the givers of Philippians 4.15 on through, let's go to the next verse, verse 5, still maintain the Amplified. Nor was this gift of theirs merely the contribution that we expected, that means what they gave only, but first the Bible says they gave themselves to the Lord and to us as his agents by the will of God entirely disregarding, listen, their personal interests. They gave as much as they possibly could, having put themselves at our disposal to be directed by the will of God. That's different from just the man who gives money. They gave their time, they gave their bodies, they gave everything that they carried. There are people who don't just tithe and give first fruit and plead with us to bless, but they even serve in the ministry. Every time they are, they are at the disposal of the will of God. They're at the disposal of the will of God. What does God want me to do? There are people you can call and tell him, where are you? And he says, I'm having lunch. I want you now. And you will drive there. Why? Because he submitted to the will of God. He submitted to a man of God and he knows anything done in that circle is the will of God. And then someone says, ah, I'm sorry, let me first finish my lunch. Why? Because yes, they can be tithers, they can be good givers, but they, are not, they have not given themselves to the ministry. The Bible says that they first of all gave themselves unto God and then after us, after to us by the will of God. So because I submit to God, I also submit to man. I'm not just a tither, I'm not just giving first fruit, but my life is also available. I'm available unto the ministry by the will of God. What does God will? Does God will that they need people to help break, bring out chairs? I must be available to bring out the chairs, okay? That is translated as, even though I'm a multi-billionaire, I can carry chairs. But there are some people, they just have small little cars, and then they, they can't even sweep a church. Because you have a car. You feel too special to clean a chair. So, you can have all sufficiency like the Philippian guy in four, chapter 4, but you're not a Macedonian experienced guy. Because the Macedonian experienced guy does not only have money, he's not only a giver, but you'll find their hands dirty for the gospel. And you must grow out of that line of thinking that you're too important for God, you're too important for the gospel, you have a very high job for you to do. And then you look around the people who are doing these things and you think they're disadvantaged people. You'll be so, so surprised that some people who do the work in this ministry are not necessarily lacking men. That mentality has to die out of church. Some people are too smart to serve. Some people are too anointed to, 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 to sit down and listen. Some people are too big for them to see and do what. They are too special. They work in very high offices to do certain things. You know, I remember one time we were building this thing. I remember the 31st of 2013 to 2014. We needed a lot of manpower. I finished my work, came here, got... Uh, whatever instruments, and we, we, I, my hands are on those tiles. In fact, I built from there up to there. I remember very well. So you, you're seated on my glory. <laughs> are you hearing me? And I remember people came and they put their hands to it. Pastor Isaiah spent three days here. 
The brands were leaving at midnight, 1 o'clock, 1 a.m., 3 a.m. They were coming to work. And I saw people drive, and then they come, and then they see everyone building, and then they go back. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Why? Maybe because you have a car. Little small car. You get what I'm coming from? Second hand car. It's hard, but it's the truth. It's hard, but it's the what? It's the truth. Don't be too rich to serve. Don't be too anointed to serve. Don't be too beautiful to serve. Don't be too handsome to serve. Please don't. Why? Because we don't need those kinds of people in Heart of Christ Ministries. There are other churches you can do it. Not here. Here we are hungry for God. We love Him. We get on our feet, put face down, worship Him. If we have to clean the chairs, we clean them. And brother, we are anointed and rich also. So in the house of God, there should be a place where all of us can do what we must do. When we must do it, you give, you tithe, you do everything, but you give yourself also holy to the will of God. Then you're going to see a hundred percent fold in your life. Why? Because there's a certain grace that can't come to a man who has not learned to work with their own hands in the things of God, bigger than how much they can spend. Am I supposed at this level to be preaching to you and building the church with my hands? Where am I now? You answer me. I'm not supposed to be building with my own hands if I'm teaching you the gospel. You see me preach to you every weekend faithfully. I've never called in sick. Do you know how or what I go through to get these summons to you every day? And yet I've been banking all these years. You get where I'm coming from? Some of you attend, you don't attend, but you're going to hear me on Afroston, you're going to hear me in Sambogo, you're going to hear me everywhere, Wednesday, Sambogo, La Bonita, Friday overnight, you're going to hear me on radio, you're going to hear me on Saturday, you're going to hear me on Sunday, you're going to hear me traveling every day of my week, every day of my life I'm preaching the gospel. But am I supposed to be holding a shovel for me to build when you guys are there, to whom I communicate, the word that gave you the job, the word that restored your marriage, the word that established you. Some of you came with demons in this church. We took time. Saturday evenings, we cast these things out. Am I supposed to be holding a shovel to clean? But I'm doing it. Why am I doing it? Because I am not 100% full. This is not for you that I'm doing it. No. And I don't want to hold you accountable to that. No. No, no, no. It's my responsibility to have 100% full. I give big in the ministry and I give myself wholly to the ministry. That's the principle. That is just different again like Thessalonians. Some people have learned a good way to do Philippians 4.16. And God is supplying all their needs according to contribution and glory in Christ Jesus. And some pastors are spoiling church members. They're saying, you might not be able to do anything in church. You might just be able only to give. It's impossible. You just can't only have the ability to give. No way. You must have extra ability not only to give, but to give yourself wholly to the gospel. It's so wrong thought to say, oh, that one is a businessman. He just sends money for the ministry. No, don't be a businessman sending money for the ministry. Once in a while, you're on a board, come and tell Bill, I want to clean the church. Get water, clean that church, sit in your bends or hammer, and then drive home. You tell me how you will not inspire a university kid to serve God. You've parked an expensive car there, and you're cleaning with your hands. How won't your children not serve God? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So that's another church. Now, in verse 2, the Bible says something that I want to pick from. I want to tell you certain three things that are very important. If you must move in the hundredfold. In verse 2, the Bible says, How be it that in great trial of affliction, the abundance, listen, of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. I repeat again, that how in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. That means they were very poor people. But they were happy and they gave more than they... Give me the Amplified Bible. Of the same. Uh-huh. For in the midst, listen, of an ordeal of severe tribulation, their abundance of joy and their depth of poverty together have overflowed in wealth of the lavish generosity on their part. They didn't have much, but they were big givers, brother. That's why the Bible says in the third verse that how they went beyond, they didn't only for as much as they can bear witness, 
according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability. They did it voluntarily, without a pay. Without a pay. Today, a guy says, me, if you don't give me 10,000, I'm not playing the piano. I've seen people in such ministry. He was one of the best students in class. He's a lecturer. There is no Sunday he has not been here. Some of you even had past degrees. There is no Sunday he was not here. I don't know one Sunday he was not here. Are you smarter? Who oh, among the best students as well? Who are not weak students? But you must understand that this gospel is bigger than your tithes and offering. It's bigger than that. It, it requires your life in the gospel. You must be available. Hallelujah. But the Bible has spoken of experiences where men get in their ability. That means I earn 100,000. Huh? I have given maybe 50. But even beyond their ability, this is a man who could even borrow for the gospel. And tell them, I will pay you later. But there is a need in the gospel. And when he's giving, he doesn't tell the pastor, by the way, hey, this money I have to borrow it. Eh? As in, I just want you to understand what favor I'm trying to do for you. No. The Bible says they entreated us. They pleaded, please, humbly, receive my seed. Even the man that gives in humility. Some of you are giving a pride of, by the way, hey, I gave you some, man. You owe me, Pastor. You owe me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, back to verse 2. When the Bible says that they, in the property they were givers, I want you to know something. Number one, the three nuggets for any man who is moving the 100% forward. Number one, write it down with your pen and paper. If a man has experienced the life of grace, If a man has experienced the life of grace, that man will never give based on his circumstances. Praise the Lord Jesus. He will never give an excuse not to give based on his circumstances. He will never. He will never. You understand what I mean? I mean to say that when you have understood the life of grace, when I'm talking about the life of grace, I mean the life of grace. The grace of God. Meaning that everything that you have or will come to you will never come to you by works, but simply believing on the God who gives them liberally. If God is your source, are you hearing me? You should never give or refuse to give, or give an excuse of not giving based on the circumstance you're in. It means there are times you'll have money, and there are times you'll not have money. But let not that circumstance limit you to give or not to give. Let your circumstance never define your giving. Ever. Ever. I asked one lady one time, she came for prayer, I need financial freedom. I asked her, do you have a job? She said, no. I don't work. So I asked her, do you tithe? She said, no, I don't tithe. I don't have a job. I said, well, that's why you're getting it wrong. We were tithing our pocket money the parents gave us. You get it? I have no excuse not to tithe because I don't have a job. You don't have a job, that's true. But there was someone who gave you 5,000 shillings and told you go to Mokona and pray. Remove that 500 and give it. Don't ever give excuse. I would have done this but I'm waiting for this payment. I would have done that, but I'm waiting for some cousin. I would have done that, but I've been too busy. I would have done this, but I have a lot of things on my plate. Never give excuse for your plate to supply the plate of God. If God is your source, never. Never. Let me tell you, we all have priorities, and there are times where the priorities that, that are ahead of us are bigger than how much we have. But there is one thing I'll never do. I'll never put the work of God secondary to any priority. I will never give excuse for not giving. Why? Because you're refusing, for example, 
to give to, a, to something. Are you hearing me? Yet, you have money, okay, to get on a taxi, go places. Where did you get it from? Who gave it to you? Answer me, who gave it to you? The Bible says he gave it seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So if it is God that gives, gives you even that money for transport, how can you not give priority to his work? Because all the money you have is for, for transport. Don't ever give excuse for not giving because you have too much on your plate. Always give. Pastor, supposing I don't have that money, give what you have. God is not asking for what you don't have. The Bible says the, man, the mind must be made up firstly on what the man has and not on what the man doesn't have. That's Corinth. That's the Corinth family. They don't understand that you don't necessarily need to have everything for you to give. No, no. If what you can give is 10,000, 5,000, 1,000, 500 shillings, according to your ability, give that. You can. But never give an excuse. Okay, cut it less. Let it be less, but give. Never give an excuse for not giving as circumstances and issues and situations that come in your life if you have experienced the life of grace. Life of grace means if you can look at yourself and realize that there are certain things that came to you without doing anything. If you can look at yourself and say there are certain things that came to me without doing anything, that's a life of grace. That's experiencing the life of grace. Because in the back end it's translated as more can come from the same source. You're not the source. You get it? More can come from the same source. You're not the source. Do you know, like I told you last, the last preaching, that you, some of you think that you're going to be rich by saving, and I'm telling you no. Because there's a principle I've learned over the years. You can never outgive God. Meaning to say, you can't give God more than he can give you. So if there's a principle standing that give and it shall come back to you good measure, second together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. It means every time your hand is released, there's another man's hand releasing. Every time your hand releases, there's another man's hand releases. Unfortunately, your seed goes as is, the man's hand releasing to you is pressed down, second together, and running over. You know what it means? It means that, for example, if he's giving you a bucket of money, he will press it down, take it over, make sure he can pack enough to distribute to you. That means you will never receive back exactly what you gave. There is always a divine plan to multiply what comes back to you. That's why I'm saying you can never outgive God. Why? Because for you don't press when you're sending a seed. No. Some of you think pressing is when you get your money and then you squeeze it so hard. Have you been around people who they shake your hand and you think they're putting a stone in your hand? Kumbe, it's a seed. <laughs> Even your hands ache to make it straight. You get what I'm coming from? I'm not talking of that. <laughs> I'm talking of the second together pressed down because of the level of abundance or oh, the, the container in which it has to come needs to be pressed to contain it you know what that means? do you know what that means? do you really know what that means? that means that when the Lord is returning to you are you hearing me? the container by which he sends will always be smaller than what he wants to give you that means you determine the size of that container. Eh, eh? You determine the size of that container. And he promises he will still stuff it more when it comes back. If you give 10%, you will receive of a certain container for the 10% group. That's why I tell people, I went past 10% now. I want to go 20, 30. I want to give there. That's why I give. Why? Because there's a certain container. You see, there are certain things and I realize that they can't fit in a tither's life. And the same things that <laughs> cannot fit in a tither's container. They are too big for a tither. They are too big for a 20% person. They are too big for a 30% person. If Bill Gates gives 50% every year and is the richest man in the world, what am I doing giving 10%? 
and the whole church was quiet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the good Lord. Amen. Praise the good Lord. Amen. That's number one. Never give out of your circumstances. Give entirely on grace if you've experienced the life of grace. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Number two. The joy that you can receive from giving is only after a particular knowledge. Meaning, the people who give with joy know something. And the people who give in pain don't know something. But the only way joy can come to our soul is if we know something. Acts 2, 28. Acts chapter 2, verse 28. Let's read. Uh-huh, one, two, three, let's go. Uh-huh. Thou hast made known to me, uh-huh, the ways of life, uh-huh. Thou shalt make me full of joy without continence. What happens? Knowledge precedes joy. Never forget that. With knowledge comes joy. With justification comes peace. Never forget those two things. With knowledge comes joy. With justification comes peace. You have peace because you're justified. You have joy because you know. That is why some of you, when we are preaching the gospel, there are times you get excited and then you start, Woo! Really, that joy is coming after knowledge. Yeah. And some of you get excited in someone. And then you see someone screaming, yes, sir, rah, rah, rah. And then you say, but what's wrong with Pastor Nixon, really? What's up with Pastor Zah? No, they're not just excited. No. There's a joy that comes in your soul when revelation hits your spirit. So it is. When a man gives... And he's not happy. It means there's something he doesn't know. He has not yet understood. Hallelujah. And if you don't give in joy, your gift can't be accepted. Because it's not given in knowledge. You get it? So the Bible says, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. You just don't get cheer. No. Joy comes after a certain kind of knowledge. That's why they, God makes known the ways of life and then the man is made full of joy with God's continent. Hallelujah. So that is for the people who are feeling, sometimes when you give and then you feel pain or you're not happy, always ask yourself, what don't I know? What am I missing? And for the biggest 98% or 99.99% of the people who don't give in joy, the one thing they don't know is this, that God is their only source. Why wouldn't I be happy to give? Who is my only source? If the president of Uganda came and told me, I was riding in the same car with him and told me, Grace, give me 100,000, I'll give it back. I give him 200. Why? He's the president. He can even order a certain amount from the Federal Reserve. That's who he is. He's the president. So I would gladly give that because he's the president of Uganda and he has a signature that he can sign and it gives me something. But that's the president. What about Jehovah God? Can the brain of Uganda say, empty your everything you have and give it to me, I need it now. But when you're done with this, you come to State House, I know what to do. Those words are enough. <laughs> Could be political language, but it's enough. I know what to do. Man, empty your whole wallet and everything you have. Why? Because when you get back, maybe, just maybe, the guy can sign you an inconvenience amount. Because he's the president. You are not giving the president. You're giving Jehovah God. 99% of the people who are not happy when they're giving, they forget their source. They forget he can give them any time. They forget he can bless them any time. The Bible says promotions come from neither east nor west. They come from Jehovah God. He raises one up and puts another down. Do, do you, do you, can you imagine what it takes God to get you whatever you need? Seconds. Seconds. 
Hallelujah. So the knowledge is what brings joy. So when we see people happy, anytime you're not happy and you're giving, there are many instances the Lord will prompt you. Uh, you know, let me say this. I've realized that in heart of Christ, we have people who give much, but we don't have people who really give big. You get it? There's a difference. There's a difference. We have people who give much, but we don't have people who really give big. When I'm talking about big, I'm talking about big. You get it? I mean, that, I mean to say a man can sow their phone and an old phone. You get it? To them, that's much. Someone can contribute a big amount. Can I tell you one thing? Among all of these people we preach to, there is only one person I know who has given big in this ministry. One. Ever since we started this church, besides the ministers, Pastor Isaiah probably, and his wife, there is only one person. Me and Pastor Isaiah know that person. They didn't give much. They gave big. I know the difference. They didn't give much. They gave big. One person like this. One person. I know. You get where I'm coming from? Let me give you an example. There are people who have built their houses and gave them out. I'm just giving you an example. Hmm? This is his hard earned money. Hmm? And he gave it out. And he didn't take a show. You know some of you, because we don't tell you what we do, you might think we don't do. You get it? You might think we don't what? We don't know. I gave people an example and I told them. Almost for the past five years I worked in banking, almost all of my salary, I gave it in the gospel. All of it. This was deeper than tithe. You get where I'm coming from? So I'm not talking of you tithing. No. I'm talking of you giving your salary every month for five years. And your relatives stop to understand you. Because you're a banker. But you're not buying stuff. You get where I'm coming from? So I'm talking about big. I'm not talking about <laughs> giving much. I'm talking about giving big. People don't have that spirit. To say that I can get five years of my salary, all of it, and give it to God. People don't have that mind. You get where I'm coming from? And there are many like things that we can't tell you. But the future will prove whether we are givers or not. But people in this ministry, I'm telling you, how can a man, the other was reading of a pastor, he got his house and gave it. A house, a whole house. Can you compare that with a guy who tithes? One time I saw with my very own eyes, one time I was at, I think, Miracle Center. A guy got keys and he gave them to a guy, bam, and he walked back. I said, God, this is faith. This is a big giver. Don't worry, we don't need your cars, we have cars. I'm only saying you have to learn to be big givers. Not just giving much, big givers. Be detached from money. Money will seek to be attached to you. He said, and these shall follow you. These shall follow you. He said, they shall follow you. They shall follow them that believe. Signs shall follow. Not only the lamb walking, even money is a sign. But you also have to enter a life of giving big. Learn to be givers. Don't give your old shoe. You know what they say? We're giving the old pe people things. People bring all their closet clothes, all even those things that don't even, you, they can't even give. Then they give them to the poor. He can't say, oh my God, my watch is too expensive, and they remove it. They're not big givers. They just give much. And I'm not asking you for your watch. I have. But I've realized that everything, let me tell you. You, you have to look at the Fanero account to understand what I'm telling you. Some of us are really big givers. That's why we're surviving. If we were not givers, we would be struggling many ways. 
But you have to learn to be a big giver. Not just giver, but a big giver. Not just giving much, but a big giver. You must enter life of being detached. Sometimes you have to make up your mind and say, God, this is too painful, but I have a certain knowledge. I have a vision that no man can ever find. No man can, no man can ever find. So if it's my only source, it's a small thing. One day we'll look back and laugh. Years ago, Pastor Isa one time got a certain pastor and he gave him a car. He gave him a car. Please, you drive. How many cars does Pastor Isa drive when he wants to drive them? Does he remember that car and say, oh, my car pained me? Now, is it by surprise that God has supplied all his needs? I know a lady he used to educate for many years, Pastor Isa. I know a lady he used to educate. That woman probably might never come to him and thank him yet. But I have seen God supply fees for his kids. And these fees were not from his pocket. The Lord just did it. So, educate a man's kid, God will educate yours. You guys are not big givers. You're just survivors who give time. Macedonia. So, if you get to a point where the Lord prompts you to give big, Always ask yourself one question. Who is my source? God. Believe it. Let go of it. You will bear us witness. We're not a manipulating ministry. We've never begged any man. And by the way, we have money. You just need to know us very well. You get it? We might not tell you, but you just watch. Paula and Paula, you realize, okay, they hard, they just don't talk. Because some people... Guy just buys like a nice car and he thinks he has money. <laughs> you know people who have kids and then they walk with them in their hands like this. <laughs> Church right now, big givers. Has very few. <laughs> Number three, the nugget. Listen to this very intently. If God calls you to a place, are you hearing me? Write this. He will supply everything you need there. If God calls you to a place, He will supply everything you need there. That's called you to a place. But, if God sent you to a people, I want you to write this. If God sent you to a people, he will put an obligation on them to provide for you everywhere you'll be. Write that. If he sent you to a place, he shall supply everything you need there. If he's the one who sent you there. But if he sends you to a people, he will put an obligation on them to meet your need everywhere you will be. Everywhere you will be. Everywhere you will be. Acts chapter 16. Verse 9. Let's go. A vision appeared unto Paul in the night. The Bible says there stood a man at of Macedonia. Again. And the Bible says, and prayed, saying in the vision, Come into Macedonia and help us. Are you hearing me? Next verse. And after, the Bible says, he had seen the vision, immediately, Paul says, we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord has called us for to preach the gospel unto them. He had a Macedonian vision. They went there called entirely by God because there was a grace. They were assured. They gathered that the Lord had called them to preach the gospel. They endeavored to go to Macedonia. And see where they go. The Bible says the churches in Macedonia gave too much. Why? Because the Lord called them there. Where the Lord sends you, he supplies. Where the Lord sends you, he what? Some men of God are struggling because the Lord didn't send them there. Some of you, the jobs you're doing, you're not happy because God did not give you that job. 
And please, let me advise you, because I've seen slavery in work. I've worked for seven years. And I've seen some men who entirely work because of slavery. Let me tell you, me has delivered from slavery while I was still banking. There was a point I reached and I stopped to work for the bank because of money. I just did it for passion's sake and fulfillment of purpose. I can tell you, the Lord is my witness to that. There are times I even forgot my money one time for like six months in the bank. Not because I couldn't do, no, no, but because I got past the thought that I must depend on the bank. I'm not a slave. Let me tell you, a man, when, the moment, if you want to know that you're enslaved, is when you stop doing things for passion, but for money. So it's the paper trail, not paper trail. Many Christians don't love the jobs they're doing. They go straight. They come back straight. Why? I have no choice. I need to get fees for my kid. That's bondage. You're a slave. You don't know, but you are. You're supposed to love what you do. Because without love, there's no innovation. That's why your mind paused in a certain angle nine. You don't add on anymore to the company. You don't subtract on anymore. You're just there. Routine. Come, work, go. Come, work, go. Come, work, go. Monday. Happy New Year. Bonus. Come, work, go. Come, work. Do your passion. Your provision will be there. That's what I believe. Do what the Lord calls you to do and do it with a passion. He will provide there. If you love teaching, you get a million dollars teaching. You teach. Don't say, ah, you need a course. You need a flat. There's no such thing as flat courses in the spirit. No. No, no, no. The race is not to the street, neither the battle to the strong, neither bread to the men of skill. But the Lord, the Bible says, provides. He, there's that opportunity he will give the flat course guy. That he might never give the first. I have guys who are first class degrees and they are not anywhere richer. Yet they are first class degree. Some people have applied for jobs and they told them you're too qualified <laughs> to work for us. Meaning another man discovered you're more potential than you thought. How did the devil convince you to apply for a less rank? By the time the devil even rejects you on the merit of you're too clever. What are you doing on such jobs? And then some people insist, no, but I want to work. That's slavery. The person has given you more potential and you've put yourself lower. The question is, is what you're doing passion? Do you love what you're doing? If you don't love it, you're in the wrong job. Look for your purpose. Because we work all our lives. You might as well enjoy the best part of your life by doing what you love. The provision will come. If your love is agriculture, you're doing nothing on that computer. Go up country and dig. Be free. That's a place of freedom. Do what you love. What will wake you up in the morning at 6 a.m. and say, I love it. And then you reach at work earlier because you love it. Without giving excuses of, I came later, I'm sorry, why, I was drugged and whatever. You're behind that computer as a banker. I used to see tellers, they're posting money and then they, they sleep. And they wake up and then they count money and then it's not balancing. And then they cry, the money's not balancing. And then they are stressed and then they put pressure on them. And then, you know, guys leave banks, hypertensive, sick, they are dying. They labor all their lives to treat later using the same amount that they Gunned all those years. They use it for treating themselves of diseases they got when they were still in those places. Vanity. You worked too hard, you hung hard, you got peptic ulcers. At your retirement, you treat peptic ulcers, operations in India, where by the time you're through, you've spent what you worked for in the ulcer because you refused to eat lunch. You're feeding for people. Do your job after that job. When you're hungry, go eat your lunch and come back and work. Because that's the joy of your labor. You know people called misers? Huh? You know people who, my, who, are, who, my, who are misers? 
Misers are people who live all their lives poor to die rich. That's the definition of a miser. Kobri, come on, no, you can't. I'll not eat expensive food. I'll eat little a bit cheaper. Then they find him sick across in rivers. Then you say, Ajat. Mpaya o fast yemu. Fast guba muchere. Akuliko sausage. Akuliko spaghetti no nyama bubiri. Nebu to makatiao. Neko vakede no. Nechi boto charu koze de chobu tunda. Bataka makatunda kamuka. Neba iwa muskali munji ne makaju zama zbububu. Five K, two K. Then you eat when you're looking like. After you're done, you come to heart of Christ in the evening. To end, oh God! When you eat that meal, don't stand next to me. Don't even shake my hand after service. You go. You have to be, you have to be careful with the money. Money can run any time. The Bible says there is that which scattereth, but tendeth to what? Increase. And there is that which gathereth, but tendeth to poverty. There are people who spend a lot on themselves and they become richer. And there are people who hold back their money and they become poorer. Because they anticipate money. No, listen darling, when you get 50,000 on payday, go sit in a very expensive restaurant where they eat meals at 40,000 and sit there. And just confess one thing, there is that which scatters and yet increases. I scatter, I increase. I scatter, I increase. I eat a lot and I increase. That's my portion. It's a very expensive meal of 40,000. Don't worry about where the food is going to be because you're looking at your need. No, he said he shall supply all your needs according to your savings. Shut up! According to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Eat big, more money will come. Eat small, you'll become poor. Because you're anticipating the reducing of money. You know, when we were growing up, that's what our parents used to tell us. Mwana wange, toyo no nasente. Rachel, turn on a sente. Sente to the trees of India. No more of the sente nyangu. Nyangu! Bane sente nyangu! Nyangu mubi karu biya buri sawa. Buy a nice clothes. Put on a nice shoe. Yes. Buy an expensive perfume. Not cobra kwa kwa. You pass someone and you're smelling like you're from you are spraying roaches. Gift of Zanzibar. No it my answer your gift of Zanzibar. Okay, called cheap perfume. Deodorants. You remember those old cheap deodorants you used to put on back in holes those days before we were born again? You put on it blue ice and it feels like plastic in your armpit. It burns you while you're poor. Someone puts on it. Then it starts to work like this. Cheap perfume. Cheap children. Shower to shower. What? Simanya sadi. Simanya what? Some of you even used to get boils. Say what? Even their deodorants have warning. Skin might chop. Beware. That's why it's 3K. Buy a nice deodorant. Let it be 12 or 15,020. By God, he shall supply. You have all sufficiency in all things. And under all circumstances, buy something nice. Go to a good hair person. Cut your beard in an expensive place. There's no things of having bumps. <laughs> Not because you have a bad skin, no. 
the, the, the saloon where you go, they don't... <laughs> Thank you. They don't sterilize. They don't... They, they, the spirit they put on you is not even surgical. It is different. It's methylated. It is methylating you. It's burning. It's flammable. You're burning your skin. Sweet cosmetics. Even you now, I'm on your case. You buy it. Fake girl. Then someone's face is green, purple. No! You child of God, buy the best there is. He shall supply. Scatter, you'll see increase. Gather, you'll see loss. Have a look where they room. Yeah. Let me leave. Make a small shoot. That's why you have back problems. Because when you buy clothes, they're not put on walls. You're like that. By the time you're through, it's a pastor. What went what the want to abagaga the battle wala? The balwala migongo. Mpakari. Atako. But for you where you buy, you can't even try on. Because they are not try on rooms. You get home and and it doesn't fit. Then you come with a cut jean and you're walking like this. Poverty. Can you join the choir? You can't do like this. <laughs> Why? You thought it you saw it and you thought it can fit. When you got home it couldn't fit. Hey, your money is over. Tell your neighbor I hate poverty. Tell him I really hate poverty. Give me a few minutes and I'll be out of here. God will supply wherever he sends you. Stop laughing. God, some of you, I need your attention. God will supply where? He sends you. And if he sends you to a people, they will supply for you wherever you go. Now, do you see that the church in Macedonia, he was called there, he went there, but the Bible says even when he left Macedonia, the church at Philippi started again to distribute. Why? Because he sent them to them. They believed in him. They gave. And after giving to him, when he left and went for other ministries outside the country, they still do what? That's why, man of God, take heed when a man gives to you when you're out of their country. Those are your people. They are your people. That's why they can meet your need even when you're out of the country. They are your people. Hallelujah. And you know there's one thing I've failed to understand about this. And this is true. Men, men, let me also go on men a bit. Because I've had women. Men. Men. <laughs> let me show you something. Act 16, let's go to the 13th verse. Mm -mm, let's continue, okay. Let's just read and we continue. I want to show you something. Uh -huh. Therefore, losing from Charles, we came with a straight course to Samo, Thracia, and the next day to Neapolis. Next verse. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of the part of Macedonia, and a colony and were in that city abiding seven days. Next verse. Uh -huh. And on the Sabbath, we went out in the city by a river where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. You realize the first connection Paul gets, even though in the vision a man called, the first people that responded to the call of God on Paul in Macedonia were women. And I'm coming. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. Now let me show you the Philippe experience in the Macedonian church. L listen, 
He says, I beseech Yodias and Sintensha, which were women, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Verse 3. And I entreat thee also, true your fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. When Paul remembers the people who labored with him most in the gospel in Macedonia, they were women. And how amazing that that person who was telling you is a big giver in this ministry is a woman. It's very hard for it to be a man. I don't know what's wrong with men. Do you know women give more than men? Did you know that? For example, if you tell a woman tithe, she won't want you to repeat it. Everybody, that if you repeat tithe to a woman, eh, there's something wrong. But men, eh, you can tell a man tithe, no. Tithe, no. Tithe, no. Tithe, no. First no. 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 I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with men. They are hard-hearted. But you see, he's testifying that those women labored with him in the gospel. And with Clement as well. Your dear son, Tintesha. They labored with him. That means that they held his burden. Let me tell you, it's one thing when somebody feels your burden. It's one thing when you have a vision and somebody can say, I can do this for that vision to go ahead. You get what I'm coming from? You get where I'm coming from? Now imagine the woman eh, who does not labor with her husband. And he has a vision. And she's the helper. Made for him. Suitable. I, I fail to understand that. But anyway, I have more issues with men. The rest of women also they also have their own issues. That's why in, in, the, in the first two, they were quarreling already. Some of you, when you read Amplified, you will never know to understand their beef. But they had their own beef also. Verse 2 there, where we were. Read in the Amplified, you'll understand what Paul meant. Uh-huh. Read. I entreat and advise the audience, and I entreat and advise the audience. To agree and work in harmony. They were already quarreling with each other. Now, also you women, I don't understand you. <laughs> Can't you just be there without fighting each other? What does the message version say? <laughs> Read the message. Huh? I urge your dear and seen Tayshe to iron out their differences and make up. God doesn't want these children holding grudges. Some of the women also, also you. I also don't understand you. Even in choir here, there are people who don't shake hands with each other. They inquire, yes, but they don't talk anymore. Of like, keep your distance, I keep mine. I will serve Apostle Grace. You will also serve Apostle Grace, but of like. <laughs> but that's a women's thing. It's not a man's thing, by the way. I, I am glad to report. We don't keep those small. But man, if you look at women here, eh, you get in their personal lives. You just move three meters away. There is someone they quarreled with. They don't shake hands anymore. You know, one time somebody said, and I'm a papa. So I hear these things every day. Papa, why does that girl look at me badly? And I'm like, which girl looks at you badly? And then one time you observe what they define as looking as badly, you realize you don't tell the difference because for you you think you just looked at them. But you see, those who have their internal walls of how they can look at each other badly without you the man understanding that they're looking at each other badly. How do you do it? It's a mystery. Because you can look at them looking at each other and you see Christian love. Kumbe has sent a message. Don't disturb me. Even if don't disturb me. By the way, I'm warning you. Even you take care. You think, who do you think you are? You think, they are quarreling. But you see, for you just see the eyes are just looking like this. For you can think she's admiring her skirt. Woo wee. How do you do it? Until I grew up, I used to think when somebody quarrels and then they twist their eyes, they're just admiring how smart you are. What? What? 
Look at her, her shoe. Where did she even buy from? It's a cheap cloth. And by the way, she doesn't. She doesn't. They get their eyes and then she smashes her. And, and you know, these eyes are funny. She gets her, throws her on the wall, puts her down and throws her on two sides. For you think, you think they are just looking at each other. Yet they are fighting. It is a real war. As in, they are throwing each other on the wall, throwing them back, 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 rolling her on the floor, flipping her shoe and then throwing it away. For it's just done in the eyes. You know, dear son, sensation. Are you hungry? We are fasting. <laughs> One more thing and get out of here. Galatians chapter 2, verse 9 to 10. There's one thing I need to teach everybody who is moving in their hundredfold. Lastly, when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be the pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, and Barnabas, the right hands of fellowship, sorry, the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that, listen, we should go unto the heathen and that they may be what? Circumcised. Next verse. Only, the Bible says, they would that we should remember the poor. The same which I also forward to you. I also forward this to you. If you want to move in the 100%, a hundredfold of God, besides your tithing and giving big in the church, Remember the poor. Remember the poor. If you know someone is in prison, carry money and take it there. Remember the principle? When I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was in prison, you. When I was in hospital, you. You visited. When did we see you sick? He wasn't sick, physical. But everything you do to the least, of my brothers, the Bible says that you do unto me. Learn to attend to the poor. Learn to attend to the poor. You're going to hear more projects as we do. That we're doing something for the village. You remember that thing we're doing. Where every kid has a very nice nutrition meal. They are poor. We're feeding them. We tell some of you to contribute 70,000 shillings a year. A year. A year. In one year, you're going to feed a kid 12 months at 70,000 shillings. And you hear them as announcements and sit down and do nothing. Yet you have the ability. Always remember the poor. We're going to do projects soon in the prisons as Fenero. Some of you will know soon. The reason why we want to start doing those things and giving big to our community in Mokono, wherever we are, is because the Bible has instructed us to remember the poor among you. Even in church. Feel too bad when you see a sister put on a bad shoe and you're smart and you can manage to buy them a shoe, buy them a shoe. And make sure we don't know that you did. You know, there are some people who, when they buy shoes, they want to hold them like this. You're welcome. I'm generous like that. Yeah. That's all me, baby. I can give you more. Bow down, lick my shoe, wash my dog. You want to show everybody that you're a giver. Don't show. The Bible says, and the Lord who sees you in secret will richly reward you. You'll be disturbed when you see a girl with a torn bag and you're sitting next to her and you have a job that can buy a simple bag. Call her one time, tell her, can I have your number? Go in town, buy her a small bag and tell her, I feel the Lord tells me, don't carry that torn bag anymore. God loves you. You don't know what you will have done to yourself. And then go out as well and find poor people. But some of you, you don't attend to poor people. Some of you have housemaids in your house, in your houses, your uncle's houses, your auntie's houses. Just surprise them. Surprise them one time and do for them something so big that they had never imagined to do in their lives. If you have a maid, one time tell her, I want to buy you clothes. Take her to town, spend 100,000 shillings on her. She might never appreciate you. She might even give you fake food the next day. That doesn't matter. The Bible says, remember the poor. Anybody who is of less advantage than you feel bad when they're putting on a certain way, when they're eating a certain way, when they're sleeping a certain way. Some of you don't really know poverty until you get to a people who are poor. America is the country it is because it is looking after our people. Look at the Watoto children's homes. Some of you have visited them. They give some of the best help to the orphans in Africa. These black people, our own Africans, they're eating orphan money. 
I met men in Hong Kong who were lying that kids were orphans. They took kids who had both parents in Hong Kong. And they were telling these kids, say your parents are dead. And then they will get money out of these guys and then they rob it. A black guy is going to Hong Kong to rob guys that he has orphans. A white guy comes from Canada and comes and feeds black people here. And then you ask yourself why Watoto is a big church. He looks after God's kids. The Bible says that he's a father to the fatherless. He that giveth to the poor lendeth unto the Lord. You lend God money and see whether he won't pay you with interest. Because you read it and said that, that money answereth all things. Isn't it? And the Bible says that he that borroweth is a servant to him that lendeth. And God said if you give to the poor, you lend God. That means you put God to servanthood. In the cases of money. He will serve you as a servant when it comes to money. It's the principle. Look for poor people and help them. Psalms 41 verse 1. I will read that and we finish. Give me the amplified. Uh-huh. Blessed, happy, fortunate, to be envied, uh-huh, is he who considers the weak and the poor. Are you hearing me? The Lord will deliver him in the time of evil and trouble. The reason why some of you, when you get in trouble, nobody can deliver you is because you don't help poor people. You don't help weak people. So when you get in evil days, when you have trouble, God has no reason to redeem you. Do you know, for example, I'll give you an example. If they diagnose you with a, a disease, a dreadful disease that is incurable, adopt an orphan. And put them in your house. And tell them, God, if I die, this kid won't go to school. You'll see. <laughs> you will see. Tell me one home where somebody looked, for, looked after a kid who was not there and that home lacked food. It has never existed. All of you can testify that. No man who has ever looked for a kid after a kid who is not his in the same household and that household has ever lacked food. It never happened. Many of the homes you see where they can lack food, you realize they're the only children. And they don't look after the poor. And they waste what should go to the poor. Some people don't even have the etiquette to keep the principle running. You eat food and throw it away. You throw food. Because you have too much. Even if you go to an expensive restaurant, eat the food, tell them, pack it, take it home. Somebody needs it. Get it packed. If it's cheap, whatever it is, Walk on the street, find the kid, give them that food, let them eat it. But never waste what kids are praying for. Never waste what people are praying for. But some of you, and look at this. Anybody who has ever slept hungry because they don't have money. Anybody who has ever slept hungry because they don't have money at one time has thrown food. You look at your life intensely. At one time you wasted food. That is irresponsible. Why? Because there is someone praying for what you are throwing. And it's wrong. It's evil. Don't waste stuff. Some just, mm, tooth was take. One day you, one day, one day you lack food. Because it's a principle. When we're growing up, my brothers are here, they can tell you, they always told us, the morning I'm married. My father's house has never run for short of food. I've never seen it in my father's house. Even on big days, we invite some neighbors and they eat with us. I've never seen us lack in my father's house. But some of you, you want stuff to rot in your fridge. When you see you're not going to eat it, get it out of your fridge. Knock the neighbors down and tell them, let's share this. But some of you want to throw rotten food because you're too proud to knock a neighbor's home. And you want food to come. You want to eat expensive food. That's why you never leave those wufundas. The Bible says, the Lord will deliver him in the time of evil and trouble. There are some troubles. And evils the Lord will deliver you from because you looked after the poor. Nothing else. The Lord will remember certain days for you because you look after the poor. Next verse. Uh -huh. Verse 2. The Lord, listen, will protect him and what? Keep him alive. He will not die anyway. He shall be called blessed in Mukono and Kampala and wherever you live. He will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. Even when men will to destroy you, God will refuse it. Why? You're helping the poor. 
you are alive for another man's life. You are alive for another man's life. If any man thinks to kill Apostle Grace Rubega, certain people will sleep hungry. And these are things I've done personally and I've never told anyone. But there are some families that know that I do it on a monthly basis. It's my principle. It's my life. I want to live long. Do something for a disadvantaged family. There are kids in Mukono paying 60000 Get that whole family. Pay for it tuition. For all them kids. There are four kids. 60 times four. How many is that? 240, right? Huh? 240. You mean I'm going to meet a man's needs of 240? Yes. Americans are coming from the USA to sponsor kids here. When Ugandans who even earn more are in Arab money. They are in newspapers, partying. That day I saw pictures of guys doing Arab money. They were just dressed like Arabs. They don't even understand what Arab money means, but they are rich. Find a guy probably has two, three, four, ten million, but twenty million on his account. He's also going for an Arab money party. He wants to say he's rich. You see, rich men, Ugandan men, are very rich. And our kids are sleeping hungry. And then American guys come from America to feed our children. I feel so bad. Because we have a poverty mindset. You don't still have faith to have enough for you to give it. Next verse. Verse 3. The Lord uh -huh, will sustain, comma, refresh. That's why you're tired in the morning every day. And strengthen him on his bed of languishing. All his bed, you, O oh Lord, will turn, change, and transform in his illness. Give me the message version of that verse. I want you to understand it very clearly. Listen to that. Whenever we're sick and in bed, God becomes our nurse and nurses us back to health. Why? Because you're looking after poor people. God can't allow you to be in bed sick when there's a person who depends on you. He can't. You need to get up. Why? Because he's the father to the fatherless. He that giveth to the poor lenders unto the Lord. Do these things. And your profiting will be evident among all. Father God, we thank you for this word. The entrance of your word brings light. In the name of Jesus Christ, we declare and declare that not only have we heard these words, they will not depart from our mouths, and we shall meditate therein day and night to observe as according as it is written, and that we shall make our way prosperous and have good success. I decree and declare that no man hearing me shall be poor. No man listening to this voice can step away. We shall be and shall move in a wealth the world has never seen, no ministry has ever experienced, and we shall look back over a few years and say, surely the Lord has done us good in Jesus' name. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.